All right, so this video is going to be over analyzing ECG, which we're just really going over the basics. Um, so this uh, PowerPoint, I've created it because a lot of people struggle with this topic because it can be very overwhelming, um, but hopefully this will alleviate some of your fears and get you feeling more confident about analyzing these rhythms. So we always start um, by just getting a couple things out on the table, some truths. So truth number one, this is hard. This is not something that's easy. This is not something that people just look at once and pick up. You need to get more and more practice to get better at it. Um, and try to look, uh, this is my second suggestion, is try to look at the picture as a whole. So when you're looking at the strip, I should say, try to look at it not as one big picture, but try to look at it as its pieces. Um, and like they're pieces of a puzzle. And that if you can figure out what the pieces are doing, you can figure out where they need to go and where they fit together as a whole. Um, and my third tip is that, you know, you should, um, when you're analyzing ECGs or looking at strips, you should do them very systematically. And I'm going to teach you a system um, to use uh, for basic ECG interpretation, but you really want to do a step-by-step, -step, um, uh, we call it a um, systematic process every time you look at one. So let's start by breaking down these puzzle pieces. So the first part of our puzzle is the P wave. Um, and if you had to call it a fancy name, it would be atrial depolarization. But the simple name is just the top of the heart squeezing. So we like to keep it simple. We're not going to go up to a patient and tell them, hey, um, yeah, this is, a, this is your atria depolarizing. They're going to look at us like we're crazy. We just say, hey, yeah, this is the top of your heart squeezing. Um, so effectively, this is telling us, are the top, is the top of the heart getting electrical activity and um, able to then squeeze and push blood to the bottom of the heart? The top of the heart and the bottom of the heart both have to work. So effectively, the P wave is just telling us, is the top of the heart working? Is it contracting? Is it able to um, get that squeeze to um, send blood to the bottom of the heart? Um, so if there's a problem with your P wave, effectively, you have a problem with the top of your heart. Um, the P wave should be present. We want it to be there. We want the top of the heart to be squeezing. It should be upright. In other words, it should be um, pointing up towards the sky, and it should also be um, very close to the QRS. Um, and that's why here I have, you know, that one of the numbers you might want to know is a PR interval. And I have another slide about that because it's talking here that the PR interval is less than 0.20 or one large box. And I know you're thinking, Boxes? What are you talking about, lady? You already have me lost, but don't worry. I'm going to get you back. Now let's go to the next slide. So when I'm talking about boxes, I'm talking about boxes like this. So usually when you print a strip, it's going to have all these boxes on it. You can see I so kindly drew this very bad um, uh, drawing of the large box, trying to outline the large box, and then I have a small box here as well. And so five small boxes make one large box. And um, effectively, all of these things, the whole reason we have boxes, large, small, and all this stuff, and we have intervals and numbers is because we're measuring time. We're measuring how long it's taking for your heart to send messages to each other um, and how well your, um, uh, we call it the top of your heart and the bottom of your heart are working. Anytime something is taking a little bit longer or it's a little bit wider, it can mean that there's a problem going on. There's something interrupting or blocking the heart from sending its signal. Um, so like I mentioned here, you can see with my little arrows here, uh, that a normal PR interval, which is the distance from the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS, is going to be, um, it should be less than one large box. And so that's just one thing to consider when we're analyzing. So the next part of the puzzle is going to be the QRS. So the fancy name for this is going to be ventricular depolarization. Um, and the simple name, of course, is the bottom of the heart squeezing. So this is the opposite of RP wave. So after the top of the heart get the signal they um, to contract, they contract, and then they are sending a signal too to the bottom of the heart um, to contract as well. Um, and it's really important. Our QRS is a very important part to understand in our EKG um, because we want to be able to um, know that the patient is... Uh, has a heartbeat, you know, and one of the ways we're going to know that they have a heartbeat is if they have QRSs. The QRS tells us that the bottom of the heart is squeezing. And what is the bottom of the heart responsible for? The bottom of the heart is responsible for getting blood to the rest of the body. So, therefore, um, when it comes to the QRS, we're pretty much figuring out, you know, hey, 
how are things going? Am I getting cardiac output? You know, how well is the um, heart working? So in other words, if you have a problem with your QRS, if it's, if it's fat, if it's wide, um, there's some problem going on in your ventricles. Maybe they're not squeezing as effectively. Um, but as a whole, if you have a problem with your QRS, you're going to be worried about cardiac output because if your heart's not squeezing properly out of your ventricles, you've got a big problem because that's how blood gets to the rest of your body. That's how blood gets to your lungs. Um, the QRS should be present and it also should be skinny. Um, and a number you might want to know is, remember how I talked about it being wide or fat? We like our QRS to be less than 0.12. So everyone gets all caught up in these QRS, like, you know, what direction it is. People get really pissed off because they're like, why is it going in different directions? Well, I hate to tell you, but everyone's heart's different. We're all a special little dandelion, and we all have our own little special things. Maybe you'll get lucky and most people will be a normal, you know, QRS, but I got hate to tell you, most people are abnormal because most of us don't have a normal heart, especially if you're in the hospital. So this is just to tell you, this slide is just to tell you that it doesn't matter what the direction the QRS is. That doesn't matter. All that matters. Is it skinny or is it fat? It's all about that, um, uh, that distance. Is it less than 0.12? So um, let's now look at the last part, which is the T wave. Um, the fancy name is the ventricular repolarization, and the simple name is the toilet. So think of uh, the T wave like your toilet for your heart. So what does a toilet do? So normally a toilet, you flush it, and then before you can flush it again, you have to wait for it to refill. So um, your heart has the same mechanism. After it takes a beat, um, it needs to take a little bit of a rest. It needs to refill before it's ready to squeeze again because there's no point in squeezing if there's nothing in the tank. So just like a toilet, there's nothing to flush if there's no fluid in the tank. So um, it needs to have time to fill. So this is your resting period. Um, so that's why a lot of people remember it. it's that repolarization or resting time where your heart's supposed to be resting. Um, the T wave should be present and it should be upright. If the T wave is upside down, you know, really, really high and peaked, um, it could be a sign of an electrolyte imbalance or some sort of um, damage to the heart. Um, the numbers you might want to know is that a QT interval is, should be less than 0 0.40. But don't worry, we're going to talk about that too. Because remember, I know I probably lost you with the PR interval, but um, let's move to the next slide and talk more about this. So just like we had a PR interval, we also have a QT interval. And this measures how long is it taking from the time the ventricle is contracting to the time it's resting. Um, but effectively, this is measuring like time between beats. Um, and while we um, want, you know, it's good to get a relaxation, it's good to fill, we don't want this time to be too long. Um, when someone has a prolonged QT, which you should know many medications can cause a prolonged QT, it puts them at high risk for having an abnormal rhythm. Remember the whole toilet idea. So during, when you flush the toilet, it's not going to, um, it, you're not going to be able to flush. If you've already just recently flushed, you can't flush again. What happens if you try to flush again? Well, it gurgles, it sputters, maybe spits some water out at your face, all that fun stuff. Um, but it's not going to effectively flush. And same with your heart. If, if your heart got a little irritable and it started to try to have a beat right in the middle of that T wave, um, what would happen? Well, you could go into an abnormal rhythm. So as a whole, when you're looking at this QT, just know this. It's supposed to be a resting period during that. Um, that T wave is, you know, your resting time. Um, so the longer the time it takes to get to that T wave, the more likely you are to be um, to get into an abnormal rhythm like ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, things like that. Um, it can, uh, it pretty much is, it's a t the longer the t uh, there is time for your heart to be irritable. Um, we don't want to irritate the heart. So, because um, just like back to the toilet example, the longer that um, it takes for your toilet to fill, the more likely you are to get um, impatient and go ahead and try to flush again. And yes, like I said again, while you flush it, maybe um, it flushes a little bit. It flushes down some of the, um, the water, but it's not going to flush the same way. So we don't want a heartbeat during this time because it's not going to be effective. So let's look at everything as a whole. Why are we studying this? Why am I um, taking the time to do this? And why are you already miserable and hitting yourself over the head with a brick? 
because this tells us, like I said before, about time. This is telling us as a whole, if you're looking at an ECG, this is going to tell you how well is the person getting perfused. Now, is it perfect? Can I say just because someone has the, a rhythm on the monitor that they're okay? Absolutely not. But this starts to give us a real good image of how things are um, uh, going in the heart. It can tell us so many things about a patient. Fluid and electrolyte balance. It can tell us um, organ perfusion. It can tell us uh, if they have um, heart disease. It can tell us if they're having a heart attack. Um, and the list goes on and on and on. Um, but uh, as a whole, at this level, it's just really important to understand it's all about cardiac output. How many beats, how many QRSs we have, that tells us how much cardiac output we have. Because remember, if your rhythm is really slow, what happens if your rhythm's slow? If you have a slow rhythm, it seems great, but um, the problem is, is that um, the less times your heart is squeezing, that your ventricles are squeezing, the less output you're getting. So the slower your rhythm um, is, usually the less your cardiac output is. And then if you get on the opposite end of the spectrum, what if your rhythm is really fast? You have a whole lot of QRSs, lots of ventricular contraction. Well, what's the problem? Well, the problem is, is that more is not always better. So the faster and the more that it's contracting, the less time it has to fill. It's not having time to relax and rest. It wears the heart out. Um, so as a whole, we just really want to know, like, how well are things going? Are we getting perfused? You know, in order to get perfused, we need to have that P wave. We need to have that QRS, and we need to have a nice little resting time. So that's what we're looking for, and we really want you to be able just to know, um, you know, what rhythms are showing that that patient's not getting cardiac output? Um, what rhythms also um, may um, uh, we call cause a decreased cardiac output? And you know what's normal because we always have to know what's normal first before we know what's abnormal. So let's get into the systematic method. Like I said, you need to have steps in order to have uh, the steps will really help you so that you don't get lost and overwhelmed by trying to look at it like an abstract painting. So your four steps are: what is the rate? Is it regular? Are there normal P waves present? And is the QRS skinny or fat? And we're going to break down each of these. So let's start looking at this. So putting it into practice. So step one, we need to calculate what the rate is. So I haven't told you how to do this yet. Um, but we calculate the rate by counting the QRS complex, uh, complexes. So you can see here in this picture, um, you know, we want to count the pointy things. So what is the rate of this strip? We have one, two, three, four. There are four QRS complexes. So once you have that number, you want to multiply it by 10. And then that is your rate. So therefore, for this rhythm, one, two, three, four, four times 10 is 40. So our this heart rate is 40 beats per minute. And then, of course, we also need to know what is normal. So what's a normal heart rate? Well, a normal heart rate is going to be 60 to 100. Anything less than 60 is what we would call bradycardia, and anything um, 100 to 150 would be um, tachycardia. So that next step is going to be, is it regular? So now we've established that we have um, so many heartbeats per minute. Now we need to see, are those heartbeats regular? Is the time that it, from one heartbeat to the next, the same? You know, that would be the difference between hearing lub-dub lub dub lub dub and hearing lub dub lub dub lub dub lub dub lub dub yep. something crazy like that so is it regular what are you hearing and of course we're not hearing we're looking here on this piece of paper um, to see um, what that um, regularity or irregularity is um, and uh, so we really um, we what we can do to do this is you can take a piece of paper and um, mark from one of the um, pointy things to one of the next of the pointy things to the QRSs um, and then see do they march out so here let's look at the next page and it'll make a little more sense so as a whole at this top rhythm this rhythm is regular you can see from um, one QRS to another it's the same distance there's all the same distance between here but then you look at this bottom this crazy chaotic rhythm look at this it's a little bit longer then a little bit shorter a little bit shorter a little a lot longer a little bit shorter a uh, longer so you know it's that irregularity so we want to know is it regular or irregular the next question we want to ask us are their normal p waves present um, so remember the things that we wanted for a p wave is is it upright and of course yes is it present so you can see in this top rhythm they are very discernible you see the little hill um, your P wave is your little hill. It's right there before the QRS. It's present. It's upright. It's pretty. 
Now you go down to this bottom rhythm and then you're like, what in the heck happened here? Where are the P waves? And this is the thing about P waves. When I say, are there normal P waves presence? Don't go trying to, you know, go on the hunt for a P wave. Um, there are some rhythms that it looks like there's like, you know, some sort of weird possible P wave. This is the thing. You're not going to get any rhythms on an exam where they're going to be, you know, completely like obscure and crazy where you're like trying to figure out, is this a P wave or not? Um, if you are not sure, if you're ever like, I don't think that's a P wave, then it probably isn't. Um, do not make this harder than what it needs to be. Um, if you do not see a pretty little tiny hill um, sitting there before every QRS, um, right where it's supposed to be upright, then you do not have normal P waves present. So the final step is you're going to see uh, if the QRS is skinny or fat. And so if you remember, a QRS being skinny, that's normal. That's what we like. And then the QRS being fat means you have a ventricular problem. There's something going on with the bottom part of your heart. So in this picture, you can see the big difference. Don't worry about the narrow QRS. We don't worry too much about that. But um, a normal QRS, it's pretty skinny. But once it's wide, that means there's something going on with the electrical system of your heart. So let's take this into practice because it's all fun and games until you actually have to actually practice it. So um, let's first start with step one. Remember, this is systematic. So step one, what is the rate? So we need to count the QRSs. So if you count the QRSs of this rhythm, which there's a lot of them, how many pointy things do we have? And I got 21. Um, and then we multiply that number by 10. So our heart rate, therefore, is 210 beats per minute. So this is a fast rhythm. Um, is it regular? So we need to measure our R to R's. Um, and so effectively, what's the time or the distance between each one? Um, and if you look at these, it looks pretty regular. You can look at most rhythms and see, yeah, that looks pretty regular. From the distance between each beat, that looks pretty regular. There's something not right here, but it's still regular. Um, and that's all that we have to answer with this question. Um, are there normal P waves present? And you can see how sad I was. Where P wave? Where are you? Um, can you see any P waves? No. And are they upright? There is no discernible P waves. I can't say. All you see is a whole bunch of these V looking like things, which are your QRS. So let's move on to the fourth step. So step four, is the QRS skinny or fat? Um, so the QRS is greater than 0.12. And so therefore it's fat. But even if you look at it, you can tell just by looking at it, it's fat. It's not normal. It's not that skinny, nice um, QRS. So therefore we know we have a ventricular problem. So we've established we have a ventricular problem. Now we need to name it. So there's two main ventricular rhythms. There's ventricular fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia. Um, with ventricular tachycardia, it's usually more regular um, and the bottom of the heart is moving too fast. Um, Ventricular fibrillation is more chaotic, irregular, and the bottom of the heart is fibrillating. So if you look at this picture, you can really see that difference. That top there is ventricular tachycardia. See how pretty it's fat, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's fat and um, fast, but um, it's still pretty regular. So, you know, fat, fast, and regular, ventricular tachycardia. We're at the bottom. What the heck's going on there? It's a whole bunch of craziness. There's nothing really happening there. Those are fibulatory waves. They are telling you lies. They're telling you that there's a heartbeat going on, and there's not. They are fibbing to you. So um, it's um, very, very irregular. And um, you can see, like, there's. it would be really hard to count the rate on this. You can't really tell, like, what the heck's going on. So what are we? We are fast, wide, and regular. Um, so like I said, you can say fast, fat, and regular. Um, so we are, therefore, ventricular tachycardia. We solved one. Woohoo! So what next? You need to do lots and lots of practice. Um, do the same way every time. Don't skip a step. Don't say, I don't need to do this, or I already know what it is. Be systematic. You don't want to, uh, you know, uh, get something wrong just because you wanted to move too fast. It's a lot better to do it systematically and be safe and make sure that you hit every single um, piece. Um, and thank you so much to Google.com for all these wonderful strips. And I will uh, be posting more videos related to EKG stuff and ECG stuff and rhythms. Um, so be on the lookout for those.